Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week, and this week's pick of the week... Precious Metal, issue number one, from Image Comics. This is written by Darcy Van Polgeest, artwork by Ian Bertram, coloring by Matt Hollingsworth, lettering by Hassan Otsman El Howe. I have been waiting for this book for years. This is a prequel of sorts to the book Little Bird. Now, Little Bird was such a crazy, imaginative, beautiful, and intriguing book that as soon as we found out that they were not done with that world, we've just been oozing with anticipation over this book, and it did not disappoint. It is oversized, it is large, and in charge. It's $5.99, but it is worth it. It's got a lot of pages to it, and it's got beautiful, intricate, detailed artwork from Ian Bertram that just soars, absolutely soars. The book itself is also very imaginative, and the world, the world of Little Bird explored even further. The basic plot is this, because even though it's set in the world of Little Bird, it isn't like a continuation of Little Bird, plus it takes place, I think, 35 years before the events of that book, but it's a whole new story, whole new characters, and they are, it, they're, they're, they're enriching this world even further, and you've never read a comic like this. Not with these ideas, not with this level of artwork, not with this level of sophistication, the coloring, the lettering, Everybody is firing on all cylinders here to make Precious Metal something truly unique, engaging, challenging, and rewarding. Absolutely top-notch. But it's about this dude. He's like paid to go find people, bring them back to who pays them to do it. He comes across this kid with this crazy power. He thinks maybe he, he can help him unlock his past because he doesn't remember his past, right? Um, and there's all these different people that are looking for this kid. It sounds like a simple story, but trust me, it's not. It's a rather challenging book. There are a lot of concepts. It doesn't spoon feed you many things, and that's what I love about this book. Truly a rewarding and enriching experience. Precious metal definitely worth the wait. Also from Image Comics, we got Scarlet, issue number one, the next step in the Energon universe's G.I. Joe build, right? We are leading into some major G.I. Joe stuff, and now that Cobra Commander and Duke have wrapped up, we got Scarlet, and now uh, coming up soon, Destro, right? Now this is written by Kelly Thompson. Kelly Thompson did one of my favorite licensed comics of all time, Jim and the Holograms. I loved it, and I loved her take on Scarlet. The character is really solid. She is being sent by Stalker to infiltrate the ninja clan that we know Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes are a part of. So like, if that's your favorite kind of corner of the G.I. Joe universe, it's also going to be building up um, and elaborating on some of that stuff. What do they call the Arasha Cogni? Arasha, I don't know. I'm not even going to pretend like I know what the term is. Um, but Scarlet was really cool. I love that characterization. I love some of the cool characters that show up from G.I. Joe, and I thought it had a really nice balance to it with the action, with the drama, and with the characterizations. The art's pretty freaking solid, too. Um, it has this nice sense of loose fluidity that also ramps up when it gets to the action-packed scenes. I loved it. It was as good as Duke Cobra Commander, though, so far has been, like, really, like, freaking awesome. But I just love the character of Cobra Commander. Scarlet's one of those characters that, when I watched G.I. Joe as a kid, and even when I try to revisit as an adult, Scarlet, Duke, they don't really work for me, right? Like, I love Flint, and I loved Lady J, right? But, man, the way that these characters are being treated in the hands of these creators, you can tell that there's a love and a passion for this property, and Kelly Thompson shares that as well. The art is uh, Marco Ferrari, and it's really good. Lee Lowridge on the coloring. Pretty solid book if you're liking Energon stuff. No reason why you won't like that one. Then we've got Falling in Love on the Path to Hell, issue number one. Brand new debut from Jerry Duggan and Image Comics. It's got pretty solid artwork in this book. 
by, let's see, the art is by Gary Brown. Um, I really did like this book. It was pretty interesting. I wasn't really looking forward to it. Didn't really know much about it, but it starts off, there's two stories going on, right? There's this guy in the, in the Old West, right? The Wild Wild West, not the Will Smith movie. But there's this dude in the Old West, he's a cowboy, and he's like on a path of revenge. Something happens, seems like his life is leaking out of him. Then, across the ocean, over in Japan, there's this woman who's like embroiled in this like samurai war and all this kind of stuff. She's also on a mission of vengeance, and it looks like her life might be ending. And then somehow, these two people wind up coming together. It was an interesting concept. It just kind of delivers the bare necessities as far as the concept goes, but it was definitely intriguing enough to entice me to come back for issue number two and see what's up. Then we got Bear Pirate Viking Queen issue number two, and like the first issue, the story is not ultra clear. You kind of have to work for it, piece it together yourself, but I did find the story to be a little bit more engaging in issue number two as compared to issue number one. But once again, it is The Art by Jonathan Marks Baravicia. The art is absolutely fan freaking tastic It looks amazing. It's got gritty texture to it. Just the story seems a little unfocused at times, but I don't even know if that's the story or if it's this combination with the art, but I did think it ironed itself out a little bit in issue number two. There's only one more issue to go, um, but I'm really digging this. And I like some of the themes that are being played with that we're seeing here about like, you know, about like, uh, the uh, like the the king and the queen and the british empire and the vikings and it's playing with some interesting stuff i still am a little like i don't understand where the bears how the bears part of it i don't really quite get that but you know what just because i didn't understand it doesn't mean that the book didn't do a good job of explaining it or maybe it does i don't know i like the art in that one a lot though kaya is here with issue number 19 another fantastic issue of wes craig's amazing fantasy story this is a one-shot issue that goes a little bit into the future we see kaya's future there's little things that are kind of sprinkled in there to go hmm i wonder how we're going to get to this part but it worked and there's a nice little backup story in here as well then we get back to the main gist of the plot in the next issue but masterful artwork, a wonderful sense of storytelling, pacing, composition. I had a lot of fun. And then the backup story was super cool too. Plus you got a Jim Mom food variant and I'm gonna give that my cover of the week. Then we've got The Last Mermaid here, issue number four. Derek Kirk Kim has been doing a fantastic job with this, uh, with this story. It's about a mermaid who's in this like mech suit that can also become a car, has weapons. She's in like a little water globe inside of it, right? And she is walking across this wasteland, going up against all these kind of problems, right? These situations. She has met somebody on her travels. Now they are joining forces together to try to find where her home place is, her homeland, home world, something like that. But the art is great. So much is done with so little. It doesn't have a lot of dialogue. It just has beautiful, gorgeous artwork that expertly crafts the story, the emotion, and the tension. Absolutely fantastic stuff, continuing the momentum that was established in the first three issues. And also, smell of the week goes to The Last Mermaid. Then we got Gunslinger Spawn here with issue number 32. Ever since the big Spawn 350 new ruler in hell, all the hell spawns lose their powers. I haven't really been digging this book that much. Like, it's kind of boring. It's kind of dulling out on me. I'm not really liking Barbary's artwork as much as I was liking it when Brett Booth was doing it. And it's nice having Brett Booth over at Spawn. And Spawn is kind of, <clears throat> I think, tightened up a little bit. But Gunslinger... It's just kind of lost some of its magic, but I'm still engaged. I'm still here to, to see how this story develops, but I'm not liking it near as much as I did. Then we got the Scorched issue number 30. We got John Lehman on this book now, and since he stepped in, I think this book has really stepped up, actually. So the, the Scorched have been captured by Jason Wynn, and it leaves the dude who is usually possessed by medieval spawn to go and try to save them, but I'm really digging this return of when I'm really liking the agency. And out of all the spawn books, I think this is the most improved post 
Spawn 350, so Scorched, I had a lot of fun with. I Hate Fairyland is here, volume two, issue number 15. Just big, dumb, crude, rude fun. That's what this book is. It's so ridiculous how fun this book is. I remember the initial series, and I never even finished that initial series, but I have been hooked here with uh, the new volume, and the artist, Brett Bean, is doing a super fantastic job, and it's just, it's just so much fun. I have so much fun with this book. Speaking of fun, wild, and wacky, how about Savage Dragon 270? We're going more into the Mickey Mouse is a pervert stuff. We're going more into just the absurd, crazy, balls-to-the-wall nature of what Eric Larson's been doing in this book lately. But I'm really digging it. I like his art. It's a little bit loose. It's not as defined as it was back 30 years ago. But you still have that energy there. And Eric Larson is somebody who is not afraid to do bold things that most people think would be distasteful to do. Um, but the Mickey Mouse stuff is really kind of cracking me up. Like, that's that's a weird stretch, but it's a properly weird stretch. All right, let's jump over to Marvel. We got the Ultimate issue number one here. Another fantastic Ultimate book. This one's written by Dennis Camp. Dennis Camp you'll know from books like Maxwell's Demons, 20th Century Men, um, Agent of World, Really solid writer. We've had him on the channel a couple of times. He's such a brilliant mind for comics, and I couldn't think of anybody more appropriate to take on the reins of the Ultimates. Now, the artist is uh, Frigeri, and, and the art's pretty good. Juan Frigeri. I do like the art, but I love the story. But the thing is this. This is the most connected into the events of Ultimate Invasion and the events of the Ultimate Universe one-shot. Like, if you didn't read those, you're probably gonna be a little bit lost here, but I like the scope. It widens the scope. X-Men's focusing in on its characters. Black Panther's focusing in on its characters, right? And Spider-Man's focusing in on Spider-Man. But The Ultimates is more about the world at large, the overarching story that we have been building up to since Ultimate Invasion. And Dennis Camp is doing Hickman proud, 100%. The concepts, the ideas, the structure of it, it all worked for me. And it's one of the most interesting takes on Giant Man that I've ever read. I loved it. Thought it was great. A really powerful first issue. Then we've got a Blood Hunt tie-in special. It's uh, the launch of a three-issue series, Blood Hunt Wolverine. Um, and this one's just kind of all right. I have not really been liking these Blood Hunt tie-ins that much. The Union Jack one actually did surprise me. But this Wolverine one just didn't really do anything for me. It's Wolverine's little side mission during the Blood Hunt event. Um... It's got some returning characters that, like, honestly, I'm a fan of, but I don't like the way that they're using this character. I'm not going to spoil it, but when you get to the end, you're going to know what I'm talking about. So, it's all right. Got a cool Kevin Eastman cover right there. Ghost Rider Final Vengeance, issue number four. I thought I would read the first issue of this series to just be done with it, right? Because I wasn't really vibing with Benjamin Percy's Ghost Rider run, but I am having fun with this, right? Parker Robbins, a.k.a. The Hood, now has the spirit of vengeance, and he's trying to use it to take over all crime in Chicago. And Johnny Blaze is on his path to find the Red Hood, <clears throat> or to find the Hood, my bad, not the Red Hood. That's obviously a way different, it's a whole different universe, right? Um, but Ghost Rider Final Vengeance... I'm having fun with it. I really am. Like, it's not change your life great or anything like that, but it's just good, solid, fun Ghost Rider hood stuff. So I'm here for it. Then we got Get Fury, issue number two. Garth Ennis, Jason Burroughs, giving us a Vietnam tale in which Nick Fury has been captured by the Viet Cong, and they don't want his secrets to the stuff that he knows about the U.S. military's plans they don't want that to get into the wrong hands, so they send Frank Castle to infiltrate and kill Fury, right? But there's a whole lot more going on. It's Garth Ennis doing what Garth Ennis does the best in comics, which is war stories and Punisher stories. So I'm really digging this book, having fun with it. So if you're an Ennis fan, definitely want to check that out. Let's jump over to DC. And from DC, we have DC Pride, a celebration of Rachel Pollock. Rachel Pollock was... 
an incredibly talented comic book writer who followed up Grant Morrison's run on Doom Patrol, introduced uh, the DC world to uh, Cod Piece, for instance, as well as Coagula. And so, unfortunately, we lost her not too long ago. And so this is a nice tribute, reprinting some stuff that's really never, some of it's never been reprinted before, right? So it reprints Doom Patrol number 70, I believe it is, yeah, which is the first appearance of Cod Piece and Coagula. Then it reprints Vertigo Visions, The Geek, which is one of Mike Allred's first DC works, so that's super cool, and I don't think that's ever been reprinted, and it's kind of hard to find because you gotta go digging through like dollar bins and stuff for it, right? And then in the an all-new story at the back with art by Ry Hickman, but written by our good friend Joe Corallo, and it is a touching and fitting tribute not just to Rachel Pollock and not just to her work on Doom Patrol, but also just... Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. It's a fitting tribute to Rachel Pollock and to her work on Doom Patrol, but it's set in the modern-day DC continuity, and I really liked it. So it was incredibly well done, and you know Joe, because Joe's one of our favorite people to have here for PCP Movie Nights, comic book discussions, and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So please support our homie Joe and the memory of Rachel Pollock and pick up DC Pride, a celebration of Rachel Pollock, especially for that Mike Allred piece. You're going to really like that. Then we got Batman here with issue 148. It's an alright issue of Batman. The artwork by Jorge Jimenez was stunning as usual. Dynamic, kinetic, exciting. The story, it's alright. You know, the Chip Zdarsky Batman run, it's kind of been up and down. It's been a little bit inconsistent. For a time, I thought as long as Jorge Jimenez was on this book, it was going to fire off right, but... I don't know, it's just alright, it's decent, but this is kind of like a big culmination of the Zoranar failsafe story, but still leading into absolute power. It was decent, it was an okay wrap-up, but I don't know, Chip's Batman run is just kind of okay, in my opinion. Then we got Poison Ivy here with issue number 23. I'm really loving Poison Ivy. 23 issues in, this is super solid, this is what we need. We need comics that are interesting, that are cool, that are allowed to actually grow breathe and develop 23 issues if this was a marvel book they would already be on a third or fourth volume right now right but they're letting this book do what it's supposed to be doing and it's engaging and enthralling because of it g willow wilson's doing some very interesting things with the character of pamela isley and at first it felt like this book was like treading that line between hero and villain but not you know it was it's a tough line to tread right but man it's completely won me over i love the art in this issue it's got some real gnarly bits to it harley quinn makes an appearance seems like pamela might be to, uh, might be done for but harley has something to say about that so poison ivy has been super solid neil before zod issue number six this book's been freaking great joe casey freaking awesome writers coming in and trying to establish Zod back as the true Superman villain that we need to see. It's got a little bit of Terrence Stamp. It's got some of the old school comic book Zod flavor, and it's just freaking awesome. Zod has lost seemingly everything. He's rebuilding his army. He's taken over this like prison ship, and he's has he has a lot of people trying to come for him. But man, you can't mess with Zod. And the artwork by uh, McDade is freaking awesome. I'm really digging this book. And we are getting a truly badass and threatening Zod. And yo, Joe Casey, you're doing the Lord's work right now. And we really do appreciate it. Shazam is here with issue number 12 with... Uh, this is Josie Campbell, right? Yeah, Josie Campbell's finale for Moving Day. Some interesting things developing with Shazam and... Billy, where Shazam's like hiding things from Billy, so we get a little bit more of that. Go we get a little bit more into depth about that, about this this fracture between the captain and Shazam. It's good, it's solid, it's not as good or solid when Mark Wade and Dan Mora was on it, but it does have this nice kind of light, fun feel to it, but at the same time being rooted in a humanity and a drama, right? So I do like it. Shazam number 12. A pretty solid issue. Then we got The Boy Wonder, issue number two from DC Black Label. Uh, Junie Ba here on the art and the writing. Chris O'Halloran on the coloring. So this is an Elseworlds-type tale. It's about Damien, but it's also about the legacy of Robbins. In the first issue, he had a team-up with Nightwing, so he kind of learned more about Nightwing through Damien's perspective. In this one, it's the Red Hood, and it works. All those beats are there, the emotional beats. 
the fun action stuff that has it rooted in just the fun superhero comic book. And I really like the interesting art. I really do think it's a cool style. And the coloring, I freaking love. So I had a lot of fun with issue number one and probably even more fun with issue number two. Over at IDW, we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Alpha. This is the start of the Jason Aaron run. Slightly disappointing, though, because most of this issue is a setup for another Turtles book to come, but it does have a very short Jason Aaron story in here with Chris Burnham on the artwork. Oh my goodness, I cannot wait to see more Chris Burnham in the pages of TMNT. Um, it's an interesting setup. It looks like uh, the mutants have, like, like, their own mutant town. Like, I haven't been reading Turtles in years, right? So it's a new world. All the Turtles have split apart. The Jason Aaron part was very exciting, and it's got me really pumped and primed for the new series to start. But the majority of this is like dealing with other stuff that feels like it's left over, dangling from the previous run, so it didn't come across as completely new reader friendly, but it is also setting up a new book to come that is called TMNT Mutant Nation, because it looks like there, there's way more mutants than there used to be. And it looked like they're like fighting for their rights and they're fighting for their existence. And so you kind of got that vibe going on. But the Chris Burnham, Jason Aaron part was really cool. Unfortunately, it was not the majority of the book. Over at Boom Studios, we got Profane issue number one. A new one from Peter Milligan, Raul Fernandez on the artwork. I enjoyed this one. It was really cool. I How to explain this book without really spoiling it. Because you, it's about a detective. It's about a detective who has trouble remembering, remembering things from his past or how he got into certain situations. His current mystery leads him to discover a writer who is somehow connected to this dude's existence. I think you can piece together what I'm talking about, but it was a really interesting concept that the way it was revealed was pretty well done. And it's Peter Milligan, so we're definitely going to give it a shot. But I'm definitely coming back for issue number two. So check that one out. I liked it. And look, we got the return of Canto. Canto, A Place Like Home, issue number one. David M. Boer, Drew Zucker, Vittorio Astoni, and And World Design. It does a great job with this recap page because it's been quite a while since we visited the world of Kanto, and it's not just like it's a fresh start. Like, we are in the thick of it now, you know what I'm saying? So it was nice because it's been a while to have that recap, but man, the heart, the charm, the, the, the striking manner in which this story goes straight to the core of story and into the heart of the reader, it is all still there. The artwork is still great. It's got a tinge of sadness to it, but it's just filled with hope and uh, the hero's journey and, and honor. So I had a lot of fun with the Canto. I'm very happy that it's returned. All right, then we got Beyond the Pale, issue number one. It's a new one from Dark Horse Comics. It was all right. It's a Vietnam story. It's about this writer, uh, a journalist. She's in Vietnam to find out why these soldiers are going MIA. And there's a supernatural tinge and element to it. But most of the book was kind of a clunky and long and dull kind of introduction to it. And it doesn't even really get into the thick of things until the very, very end. And then you're just kind of left going, I don't know if I want to come back for issue number two. So issue number one was just all right, but maybe a little bit clumsy. Not as clumsy as this one. The Mammoth issue number one. This book didn't do enough to entice me to come back for an issue number two. It took a long time to kind of get to the point of the book. There's these like geologists or something. They're trying to figure out why this one part of the world has like these crazy uh, like like quakes and things that don't make sense and like cloud. Like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of all over, all over the place. One of them winds up dying. They're trying to figure out why. It, it, it doesn't really get to the meat of anything until maybe at the very, very tail end, but it just never really, it never really pulled me forward. I didn't really enjoy any of the, the, the story plot. I didn't really uh, engage with any of the characters. So this one to me, I, I thought it was just all right. Space Ghost issue number two, though, I thought was better than issue number one. A darker, more violent, more visceral and raw and edgy approach to Space Ghost without going too over the top and ruining the core of that concept and what makes it shine. David Popose obviously has an understanding of this character and how to revitalize this property for new and old fans alike. And I'm having fun with it, right? And 
in a book that's going to have a little bit of a darker, grittier tone to it, and Space Ghost is supposed to have like two kid sidekicks and a monkey, how do we make that work and make it make sense? David Popose does it excellently well here. Plus, Jonathan Lau's artwork has some really nice dynamic energy to it. Um, but I'm enjoying the book, so if you're a Space Ghost fan, you got to check that one out. Then we've got Slash Presents Deathstalker from Vault Comics, issue number two. Just stupid. Just stupid, but I'm having a lot of fun with it, right? It's crude. It's irreverent. It's trying to be edgy. But it's awesome. It's kind of like in the vein of Barbaric. It's based on a movie from back in the day, which I've never seen. But if you're familiar with the movie, maybe you'll be familiar with this. But, you know, lots of sex jokes. It's Tim Seeley, right? So lots of sex jokes, decent artwork, lots of violence. But it actually has a core of humanity at the end of it that I really thought was striking. And there's this one gnarly bit where this boil, like, pops up. This, like, thing comes out of it. That was pretty cool, so I like that. Then we've got Crash Down here with issue number four. Great cover from David Mack. Um, Comic Tom, Fire Guy Ryan. This is the final issue of Crash Down for now, and as I was reading it, I was like, this feels like it's all wrapping up really quickly, but at the end of the book, it's promised this book is going to return and continue. So I liked the setup. It takes the story into a whole different direction. It really embraces the Lovecraftian nature of the story, and it also has influences from like the TV show Lost and stuff like that. Ben Tubble Smith's artwork is all right, maybe a little bit rushed feeling here in this uh, final issue, but it also feels kind of extra sized. Feels like it was longer. But it's got some real cool gnarly bits in it too. But I did appreciate the setup and the ending and what's to come. All right, so that's what I read. So let's revisit it. Crash Down felt like it was going to wrap everything up too much, but it actually just set up for Act 2, basically. Deathstalker is crude, rude, fun. Space Ghost, dark, edgy, and gritty without going too extreme and over the top. The Mammoth and Beyond the Pale just didn't do quite enough to pull me in, but Kanto pulled me right back in and reminded me of why it was one of my favorite comics for a long time. Profane, a super solid debut again from Pete Milligan. Then we got TMNT Alpha, great on the Jason Aaron story. The other story just feels like it's kind of dealing with some after stuff and setting up another book to come. So it was all right, but not quite the revitalization of the TMNT franchise that I was wanting, but that's to come next month with the new number one. Then we got The Boy Wonder, an exploration of the legacy of Robin with some really solid artwork. Shazam, not as good as the Dan Mora stuff, but still pretty solid. Neil Before Zod is just badass. Poison Ivy is awesome, and kudos to DC for allowing this book just to exist and breathe. That's awesome. Batman wraps up the fail-safe stuff, but also leads into absolute power. It was I. DC Pride, a celebration of Rachel Pollock. Y'all, must read. If you've never read any of Rachel's work, definitely check this one out. First appearance of Codpiece and Coagula, uh, the debut of Mike Allred over at DC, and a nice touching tribute to her work on Doom Patrol from our friend Joe Corallo. Get Fury, Ennis Fury, Punisher Vietnam. Nuff said. Ghost Rider Final Vengeance. Man, I'm having fun with that dumb book. Uh, Blood Hunt Wolverine just didn't do it for me. The Ultimates, great concepts, great delivery and execution. The biggest book of Dennis Camp's career, and it is deservedly so. Congrats, buddy. That's freaking awesome. Savage Dragon's wild. Just wild. I hate Fairyland. I mean, if you like this book, you're going to like the book, right? Scorched has really turned a new corner, a new leaf, since the Spawn 350 stuff. Gunslinger, though, has gone in the opposite direction. Last Mermaid's got the smell of the week and just another fantastic, beautifully rendered book. Uh, Kaya, a really solid glimpse into the future, a one-shot issue set away from the main story, but still very enticing and intriguing. And that Jim Mafu variant gets my cover of the week. Then we got Bear Pirate Viking Queen. I think it's solidifying its concept, thematics, and story, and the artwork continues to just mesmerize. Falling in Love, On the Path to Hell, was a really interesting debut that has me enticed to come back. Scarlet, Kelly Thompson's got love for this character, love for this franchise, and yo, somebody you've been waiting to see in the pages of G.I. Joe books shows up. That's all I'm going to say, but Precious Metal. How long we've been waiting on this book? Five years? Worth every single ounce of anticipation. Amazing artwork. Beautifully enriched world. A challenging book, but a rewarding book that is enriching comics. It's innovative. It's a great use of the format. And the artwork is just freaking insane. 
great high concept sci-fi set in the world of Little Bird there in Precious Metal. So that's what I read. That's what I'm digging. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. We're almost at 20,000 subscribers. It could happen this week. We just need you to thumbs up the video, hit that subscribe button. We really do appreciate it, y'all. And if you want to help support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash PCP. Anyway, I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Station, keep on reading. Pop, pop, boom!